بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى أجمعين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وعلى العودة من لساني وفضل السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته This beautiful day uh, in this beautiful university and the beautiful hearts of uh, our people here uh, Of course I cannot talk about their brains they might also be nice, but I cannot talk on brains because the specialist is here. He will talk later on that. Okay, let us start this session to the Baraka by reciting of Al Fatiha. Okay, welcome to this. Uh, we we can say first. Uh, webinar, which is the KICT Intellectual Talk Series, first uh, after COVID, because we had it uh, before, about physical, now this is the first one, which is a collaboration between the uh, Research and Innovation Office and the uh, uh, Committee of the Promotion and uh, Marketing Committee headed by Dr. Muni. So thanks for Dr. Muni also for this collaboration. I would like first to welcome all of you to the Garden of Knowledge and Virtue, and uh, to welcome our speaker, uh, Professor Abdullah bin Abdurrahman, the Dean of uh, Kulia of Information and Communication Technology. Um, as you know, after COVID, everything changed now, and uh, everybody is under this stress, and uh, even countries sometimes they don't know what they are facing and how to how to manage. Uh, one of the important topics now, uh, sometimes we ask ourselves, okay, EEG and ECG are there since, uh, EEG is, is there since the, the beginning of the 20th century, so what's new, why, why now it's different, how we are using that. But the most important now, after this COVID, people are going under uh, severe stress and, and uh, difficulties. Uh, how this can affect nations, societies, uh, how we can benefit the society. As you know, we, we IUM are uh, leading the way, we, we always say Rahmat al alamin we help the society. So how we can help this? Uh, the, the topic of today's talk is measuring stress level at post-COVID using neuro computational method. So how this measuring is done, what's the effect of this measuring? What, what are we measuring? Uh, how this measuring can help in the diagnosis or even giving solutions? We have so many questions, but uh, those questions, in addition to other questions you might raise, we have to be patient and wait for a while until our experts can, can answer. But before, before uh, giving the floor to our speaker, let me just introduce a little bit. Of course, I cannot go through the whole uh, uh, CV or the bio because then uh, I will take the whole one hour. Uh, Prof. Abdul Wahab uh, bin Abdul Rahman started his career with the HP, he was at Packard, and has worked in Singapore and in the US, uh, Colorado, before joining the faculty uh, as a faculty member in NTU, Singapore, in 1990. In, nine, in 2009, he joined uh, this university. He joined the Kulia of Information and Communication Technology, and uh, then he led the, uh, this research. He is the, the pioneer in this research, uh, which is the, in the area of understanding and analyzing the brain development disorder using the EEG and ECG as uh, uh, a neurocardiac signal model. Uh, NCM of the brain and the heart. He has now so many projects leading them. Uh, uh, example of them, identifying children with learning disorder using the MPI, analyzing addicts' behavior after uh, intervention based on EEG and ECG signals analysis, visualizing human emotional state stress an analysis under various conditions, effectiveness of Tafir's students in memorizing through brain-inspired uh, effective modeling and, and so many other uh, projects 
uh, uh, some of them are uh, eye eyewitness. And uh, so, in addition to all this, of course, uh, to this CV, he is also my close friend. So that's why I'm happy today to be here. So we have we have many questions uh, and in mind uh, how those. Uh, signals from the brain, it has been there for a long time, what is the new about it, how to, how to convert those signals to emotions, how to, to, to interpret, all those uh, questions. So the floor will be as follows. I will hand over the, the floor to Prof. Abdurrahab. He will present for half an hour, maximum 35 minutes. And then uh, we will, uh, uh, after this, switch to the Q&A. So I request all of you, please, if you have a question, you have the chat there, raise your question, write it there, and then after this, I will take the questions one by one, inshallah. So if we agree, then let's say bismillah and invite our Professor Abdullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, thank you, uh, Prof. Imad, uh, my good friend also. Uh, okay, uh, what uh, I am uh, uh, really interested this morning is just to introduce to you uh, some of the things that uh, we, can, we can do uh, as far as the uh, uh, monitoring the brain information. Uh, and from there, we should be able to get a better idea on how we can extract or benefits uh, from the uh, brain uh, information. Uh, but of course, uh, in order to understand the uh, brain information, as far as looking at the present situation where we're talking about the, uh, the COVID or the coronavirus itself, uh, a lot of people have been under stress. And uh, that is why uh, we want to see, <clears throat> at least to a certain extent, <clears throat> of what we can do to measure stress, okay? So in this case here, uh, if you ask the psychologists, uh, they will say that uh, they will have a lot of instruments that they can use to measure stress and so forth. Uh, but of course, uh, those are based on instruments, psychological instruments. But here we are going to let you look at some alternative rather than the uh, psychological instruments. Uh, but we, what we can do directly from measuring the brainwave patterns itself. Of course, other than that, uh, people have also tried to measure stress from sweat or perspiration uh, or even the uh, ECG, okay, or even the, the heartbeat, you know, as your heartbeat uh, becomes uh, uh, faster, you know, or he's getting excited, increase in anxiety and so forth, okay. But uh, today, I will just focus on the, uh, the brainwave patterns and how uh, we can use the brainwave patterns to measure uh, stress. Uh, but of course, other than that, uh, we have also worked on the brainwave patterns to do some other thing. But uh, let me introduce that at the end of the lecture uh, rather than now. So maybe I will try and look at the next slide. Ah, okay, uh, what I have here is I just picked up from uh, Qualtrics as far as the amount of stress that people uh, actually have been facing uh, because of this uh, COVID-19, okay? Uh, you will find that about 53.8%, okay? Almost 60%, uh, okay? Of people are emotionally exhausted, okay? This could be because uh, some of us, you know, when you talk about COVID-19, especially at the early stage of the MCO, we all are very concerned, we all are very scared, you know, uh, and everybody try to avoid everybody else, uh, especially uh, when you listen to the news, people talking about, oh, you know, how bad it is when these people are affected by this uh, coronavirus and so forth, you know. Uh, and people are starting to die because of the coronavirus. And then you look at Italy, at one point of time, we have, uh, what, 50,000 per day infected. Uh, and the death rate goes as high as hundreds, you know. So therefore, people are getting scared, uh, emotionally are affected. <clears throat> so therefore, in this case here, what we wanted to do was to know uh, what kind of stress are you talking about as far as this individual? 
<clears throat> because only by understanding the kind of different stress, for example, you know, you may have <clears throat> stress due to depression, anxiety, you know, and stress itself. So therefore, in this case here, uh, it may uh, affect uh, different kind of intervention that you may, <coughs> excuse me, excuse me. Okay, uh, so this is what I'm trying to say, is that as far as this particular uh, slide uh, uh, is trying to say is that uh, emotionally people are affected and therefore we have to really try and ha handle some of this uh, emotion. Uh, but before we can really do some of this intervention process, I am very sure most of the psychiatrists and psychologists will agree with me that uh, yes, emotion is something that we need to handle carefully because unless otherwise we, we understand the sources, then you will find that this will be very, very difficult. <coughs> <coughs> of course, nowadays, people talk about uh, mental health and relationship or mental health to stress. And if you find and if you Google, you talk to a lot of doctors, you know, people will talk about uh, uh, mental health in relation to sleep, you know, if you have uh, less number of sleep, then maybe you will be affected by the mental health, you know. Uh, so therefore, in this case here, there are a lot of correlation and a lot of study has been done. Uh, but what is interesting is that as far as stress is the inverse proportion to the COVID. Okay, you find that a lot of the older people are getting COVID and they die because of the COVID-19. But if you find that a lot of younger generation, they do not know how to cope with the stress, uh, which a lot of older people, I mean, because of their experience and so far, they are able to cope with stress. So therefore, in this case, you find that the number or the percentage of stress uh, for older age is much less okay, than the one uh, for the younger people. But in relation to that also, you will find, this is true, uh, because uh, even uh, you find that uh, as you grow older, you have less sleep, you know, and uh, you tend to maybe do more kiamulai, you know. Uh, so therefore, in this case here, the number of sleep that you get is also much less as you age. But interesting enough that even the stress, okay, as you age, is become less and lesser because uh, older people normally they know how to handle stress. But what is important during the COVID-19 is that a lot of people are stressed because of financial issues. Okay? You will find that uh, people get uh, become jobless, you know, uh, unemployed, the number or the rate of un unemployed is also increased. So therefore, the government has to play their role in trying to help these people. Businesses begin to collapse and so forth. So therefore, in this case here, you have more stress not only because of emotional uh, stress due to the, the COVID itself, but also stress because of the financial issues. Because as you are jobless, of course, I'm very sure once you are unemployed, you know, the stress level for you gets higher and higher and sometimes it overshoots. So therefore, in this case here, yeah, how do we actually measure? I'm not going to talk about how do you handle stress because that is not my area. My area is just how to try and read and understand stress. So I think that is one of the areas that we really need to understand because once we can understand stress, the different kind of stress and so forth, then uh, the psychologists or the psychiatrists can help us how to handle this particular type of stress. Okay. Of course, uh, in the case of the uh, COVID-19, the, the one that is affected most, as you know, is a, uh, actually the uh, leisure and hospitality. Okay, And that's where the unemployment has actually rose. Even here, if you look at the graph, you know, you can find that retrenchment has also climbed. Okay, so therefore in this case here, uh, all of us has to be aware. Okay, and this is really uh, very, very bad. And you can see that the service sector, service sector there is about 10,400 people. So, uh, which is affected as far as the COVID-19 is concerned. So therefore, we, we are very, very concerned. The government is very concerned. Everybody is very concerned. Businesses, uh, you know, there are a lot of businesses starts to collapse and because of this COVID-19 situation, okay? Okay, uh, this is my last slide talking about the statistics. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, 
uh, we have about 39 percent okay, in the leisure and hospitality uh, industry uh, you know wholesale industry and retail industry where we're talking about 17 percent okay uh, and, and so forth okay so therefore in this case here if you want to try and book hotel like my friend recently went to Langkawi you know he says oh you know we find a lot of hotels in Langkawi are now vacant you know you can really go to Langkawi so maybe you want to go to Langkawi and have some some break you know <laughs> so but i think these are the kind of things that is happening okay so therefore uh the leisure and hospitality industry is really being affected okay let's talk about stress uh, what i want to focus as far as stress is concerned uh, is that uh, there is a lot of uh, relationship between stress to emotion okay because if you talk about stress there are a lot of relationship to emotion and because of that I want to just focus on this particular area as far as the brainwave pattern itself. Of course, there are a lot of other work that people have done in looking at the brainwave pattern, you know, uh, where they look at trying to generalize stress. I'm not trying to generalize stress, but I want to monitor stress on an individual level. So therefore, we have a very good idea of the kind of stress that is affected by individual. And because of that, we really need to understand the amount of emotion uh, as far as using this valence and arousal okay because if i can use this valence and arousal these are the two dimension or the two basis function that i can use and and with that i can have a very good idea as far as relative stress rather than absolute stress okay i i do not want to look at uh, absolute stress because if you look at absolute stress then there is a lot of dependency because each individual will uh, behave differently as far as their emotion as far as their stress is concerned okay and some people can take more stress than other people of course okay but here when, when i take a look at the relative stress so it is more meaningful to us okay rather than just absolute stress so therefore don't ask me if we can generalize stress we cannot okay when you try to generalize stress i am very sure you will fail because when you try to generalize stress, in other words, I want to measure stress and try to see the standard of stress for all the people in the world, I think it is going to be a real big challenge for you. The reason is because uh, you go to a different culture, the stress will be very different. Uh, you go to a different country, the stress will be very different. You go to a different age, the stress will be very different. So everything is relative as far as stress is concerned. So that is why, if you notice here, we are using this valence and arousal, and you will find later that it is more of a relative stress rather than absolute stress. Okay, the basis of this stress that we want to do, if you look at this, uh, this ASM chart, okay, or the uh, sp affective space model, uh, which is defined by psychologists, uh, and this is also the Russell's model, we call it, uh, you have basically the left side, which is unpleasant, the right side, which is pleasant, and then uh, the Y coordinate telling us about the activation, the amount uh, or the degree, okay, as far as and the deactivation, activation and deactivation, positive and negative. So that will basically give us a very good idea as far as the amount of uh, stress. So in this case, I give an example like on the uh, right quadrant there, uh, between the positive activation and positive pleasant there, you have happy, uh, excited, alert. So that is in that particular quadrant. But on the other hand, the opposite side of it, where you have the unpleasant and the deactivation, you can be bored, for example. Like it, I give an example, if you are driving, okay, and you are sleepy while driving, okay, the likelihood is that you will be bored. Okay, that is why you are sleepy while you drive. So what do you do? Normally, you try to activate yourself, okay, by providing some kind of positive activation, okay, uh, by providing uh, some music, you know, uh, so that you can avoid being sleepy. So therefore, in this case here, yeah, sleepy relates to bored, okay, but at the same time, sleepy can also uh, be involved with angry, okay because you are angry why you are sleepy you know so you you just feel angry rather than you are bored so in this case here 
your activation will be higher and you will have unpleasant situation. So therefore, in this case here, you are on the stress side rather than on the bored side. So even on the same situation where we talk about being sleepy itself can mean a lot of factor as far as the, as the effective space model is concerned. So therefore, it is important that for us to analyze this and really have a very good understanding. And I would recommend that when you do all this analysis, really to look at or refer to some psychological understanding, okay, or some psychologists uh, to work together with you so that you have a very good idea of what you are looking at. Okay. okay. Now, so what is the emotion uh, or the relationship between emotion to stress? First of all, emotion analysis can be accurately performed using valence and arousal. We have done quite a few of our work. I'm not going to go into the details of some of this work. If you are interested, you can uh, contact our group, which is the uh, PCBDG group. Uh, and uh, uh, they have been uh, looking at a lot of this analysis on uh, emotion uh, and stress correlation. Uh, you can also understand the emotional stress. We also now are looking at negative stress and positive stress. Okay, what do you mean by positive stress? Sometimes we do want stress because if we have stress, it actually motivates us to do more, to do better. Okay, because sometimes you don't have any stress, uh, you don't even bother. You know, this tida apa mentality. You know, so therefore in this case here, we want to have some form of stress, uh, but it must be a positive stress rather than the negative stress. So therefore, in this case here, it is good to have stress, but it is no good to have too much stress. <laughs> then, then you are really in trouble. Pre-motion or precursor emotion is another factor that can also affect stress. For example, you know, before you really look uh, at driving, before you really drive, you know, if you are fighting with your, you know, your spouse or your parents or your mother, you get angry with them, you know, then when you try, it is actually endangering your driving. Okay, so therefore in this case here, we call it precursor emotion or the pre-emotion. And these can affect a lot, you know, because when you are stressed, you are driving, this precursor emotion can cause a lot of situation due to the subconscious mind. So therefore in this case here, we also have to be very careful and we have means and ways to actually measure some of these precursor emotion uh, during what we call the idle state, okay? So I'm not going to go into the detail of that. That would be another subject that we can refer to in some other time. So uh, I'm just giving you some flavor, okay? <laughs> of what can be done, okay? So uh, mini motion is another one that can help stress management. But when mini motion is measured with time, that will give you what we call uh, the energy of emotion, okay, or mood sometimes. So therefore you develop mood in this case here because that same emotion is developed through time. So therefore in this case here, you become moody, okay, you have a positive mood, negative mood and so forth, you can with respect to time by integrating. So if you do an integration, then you do have the mood in this case here. So you can derive mood from emotion itself. So what we are using here is what we call the neurophysiological interface of effect. Bottom line is that we are monitoring your brainwave pattern, okay, using the 19-channel EEG that we, we have right now. In the previous work, we used a lot of the 8-channel EEG, uh, but we never believe in using 1-channel EEG because in 1-channel EEG, you will never get anywhere. Of course, there are some researchers not uh, who do not rely on the psychiatrists or psychologists, okay, they say, oh, no, 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 I just do a one channel or two channel EEG, this is sufficient. Uh, let me give the information is that uh, you can do that uh, particular one once, okay, but after that you cannot repeat, you know, whatever results. So the results most likely is not going to be repeatable. Okay, <clears throat> okay. I'm not going to go through detail. This one here is just to tell you that uh, these are some of the part of the brain, okay, which is a scalp that we actually use to measure. These are on the eight channel, but right now we are doing it with the 19 channel because that is recommended by our colleagues uh, in, uh, in Europe where they are now looking at all 19 channel rather than eight channel anymore. These are some examples of the uh, uh, EEG electrode placement that uh, we have done. 
this is the earlier version of it where we do not have any uh, any cap. Okay, right now you know, with the cap, it, it will be much easier. But we found that if you are used to it, using this particular one will be much much easier to actually do the measurement because it gives you a better conductivity. Okay. I think uh, most of uh, the group who has done a lot of work uh, using uh, this manual method, uh, you find that uh, ooh, it's much easier for us. But of course, nowadays, uh, all the younger ones, they are using the cap, okay? Especially when you want to monitor the uh, brainwave pattern, especially for those younger kids, okay? Uh, and they cannot stay around, uh, you know, still uh, for a long period of time. You give them five minutes after that, uh, you know, they will move around. And if you have uh, children with ADHD or autistic children, it's even worse for you to measure uh, some of their, uh, their brainwave pattern will be a real big challenge for you, okay? Okay, just to give you some idea, uh, one of the examples here which I want to go through very, very quickly is that uh, we actually measure behavior. And I want to relate behavior because behavior here becomes important and critical to understanding uh, the amount of stress that you can have. But behavior here is because we use the, the measurement that we, we actually measure from the EEG. Uh, and then after that, we try to correlate that to the actual measurement that we get from the psychological instruments. So we do psychological instruments and then we try to relate. As an example here, on the top portion is where we make use of the EEG. Uh, we just use the four uh, emotion, which is the happy, fear, set, and calm. And then from there, we derive the valence and arousal for all that four quadrant. Remember, I talked about the four quadrant. So we can have the valence, positive valence, positive uh, activation, and then uh, positive valence, negative activation, and so forth. And of course, the last one is the negative uh, valence and negative activation. And from there, we correlate it with the new FFI personality questionnaire, which we use, uh, is used by the psychological psychologists uh, as far as the psychological instruments. So from these psychological instruments, we then correlate it, okay, together with the, uh, with our, our EEG uh, bandwidth patterns. And we can now derive an algorithm Okay, as far as the uh, different, uh, like for example, neurotism, you know, what is the correlation of neurotism with the different uh, emotion? What is the correlation of extroversion with the different, uh, uh, what do you call that, uh, the different emotion, okay, from the brainwave pattern and then the conscientiousness and so forth. So I will just go and uh, give you some answer to it, okay? So this is the score, you can do a T-score, okay? Or you can just do a trade type. Okay? In other words, positive or uh, zero or one. Okay, or you can go through the detail of the score. Okay, that gives you the different five different types of uh, five factor design or five factor behavior, and then we correlate that to our uh, emotion. So here I have simplified the whole thing and tells you the results of what we have based on uh, 50 participants, okay, that uh, we use 50 participants at this point of time. Uh, if you are interested, uh, we can work on more participants uh, to actually go and get for the agreeableness, okay, and those that uh, we have not filled up the blank. But as far as, as neurotism is concerned, you know, we can get as good as, uh, you know, uh, plus minus 13% uh, accuracy, okay. Uh, and if we go for the extroversion, you can see that uh, we can go as slow as uh, less than 5% uh, error, okay, using the valence of the set, valence of calm, and valence of the, uh, uh, what do you call that, uh, the emotion, the three different emotion. So in this particular case, uh, with the algorithm there, we can straight away now use the brainwave patterns <clears throat> and tells you <coughs> the different types of uh, five factor. Uh, behavior. Okay, so this is an example of how <coughs> emotion <coughs> can relate uh, to behavior. But what I want to show you next is that uh, 
if you are trying to measure the depression, anxiety, and stress, okay, this is one of uh, Dr. Noor Haslinda's student uh, in uh, UITM. Uh, he actually measured the uh, the depression. He tried to understand uh, dysphoria. Uh, dysphoria in terms of the uh, depression, anxiety, stress, and how can we actually extract from the brainwave patterns, okay, in this particular case. So you can see from here that if you are going to use DAS, DAS may not be able to give you uh, the correct uh, information as far as uh, depression, anxiety, and stress. Uh, because sometimes it is too close, okay, the differences between depression, anxiety, and stress. So all the other information do not give you a complete one other than the Napier, which is the NDS. So we compare these two between DAS and NDS, and we found that, which is quite interesting, the same number of people we have, about 10, uh, although it is only nine subjects, give us a preliminary idea when we try to detect their depression, anxiety, or stress, using the DAS21, every one of them indicate it is normal, which is quite interesting. And what we found is that only NDS, using NDS, we can now actually measure the different type of, uh, you know, like irritability, discontent, surrender, interpersonal resentment, and so forth, you know, giving you the different mild, severe, moderate, and so forth, okay? Now, what we want to do with this particular information is to relate. So we are able to relate this as far as fear is concerned. So when we measure the amount of fear during the idle state, in other words, when this individual close their eyes and we measure the amount of fear, when they close their eyes, we can see that the amount of fear tells us the severity of the dysphoria in this case here. Okay, so therefore, we can do that right now and just by looking at fear during the idle state. So I think this will help us in identify some of the information about whether this individual is having stress or potentially to have stress, okay, in this particular case. And we hope that this particular tools can be used post-COVID, okay, that uh, in post-COVID situation, we are able to measure just by looking at the brain with patterns you know, rather than uh, looking at the uh, psychological instruments, we can do that. Okay, and uh, by looking at the fear, the amount of fear during the idle state, you know, we are able to determine roughly or get some idea on the severity of the dysphoria for this particular individual. Okay, there are many others, uh, other information that I can share with you. But uh, maybe on, on other note or on other platform, uh, we can actually talk about this one here. Uh, like, for example, uh, we are now working together uh, with the uh, Panawa Hospital uh, in trying to identify some early detection of learning disabilities like autistic children. Okay, and we are trying to develop, uh, you know, uh, some ideas as far as profiling the student and so forth. Uh, other than that, uh, we have worked with the uh, Indonesian counterpart under YBH to try and identify a children or student at the age of 9 to 13 uh, who has the potential or who is suffering uh, from what we call uh, porn uh, addiction, okay? Uh, or many other addictions uh, that we try to identify at the same time. So therefore, if you are interested in looking at uh, some of this research, uh, in looking at brainwave research, you know, you can come to our group. Uh, we have a, a group that's called the PCBDG. So we are active uh, and we have uh, a few uh, EEG machine. Uh, we have the old uh, 8 channel and the new 19 channel. Uh, and we also have some group who are looking at ECG, not just the EEG. Okay, this is also Profimat's group in looking at the ECG. So therefore, there are a lot more that we can do and uh, please uh, come uh, the research uh, is a, is a, is a very open research uh, and there are a lot of opportunity to actually look at some of this research thank you very much i would like to thank uh, dr moni and his group uh, profimat uh, and the whole of the uh, pcbdg the pervasive computing brain development group you know uh, for being active uh, in pursuing this uh, particular research and i hope that uh, we can have a lot more breakthroughs 
uh, and grants uh, to actually more do uh, more uh, do more of this research and uh, all our PhD and master students okay who have uh, been participative in this particular research so yeah as the uh, uh, the cartoon says you know these are some of the world uh, without engineers uh, uh, if anybody is familiar with the backers you know I'm not sure uh, whether the young ones have used the backers before <laughs> Okay, uh, slight, what do you call that? Slight rule, right? Slight rule. Right? Okay, thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Oh, we have QA. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Prof, for the uh, wonderful presentation. And uh, uh, also, the, the timing is uh, really uh, crucial. Thank you, thank you very much. I think I'll just take. Uh, the opportunity or the authority as a moderator, then I will I will raise one question before I take the questions from there. Rob, maybe just just an outsider can say, okay, you are measuring the, the stress, although you know that uh, your job is, is to measure. After this, uh, it mm -hmm. is not with you. But what is the significance of this? How, how the society, the countries, the officials, how they can benefit from this measure? What is the, what's the significance of that? Uh, you see, what, what I mentioned earlier is that this measurement will give you a more detailed perspective of what uh, or how the brain behaves. In other words, the degree of the, uh, the stress. You know, it could be that you're having anxiety. Okay, maybe the anxiety level is very low. So then maybe it's not really that bad. Okay, but if the anxiety level is very high, then really, uh, as far as the, the psychologists or the intervention process is concerned, then they know uh, okay what kind of intervention and so forth that can be done. So this one here needs some kind of a framework, okay, which uh, we need to develop further together with the psychologists and the psychiatrists, you know, with the different kind uh, or the different level of the depression, anxiety, or in this case here, the stress, okay. So therefore, it is it is the beginning. That's what I'm saying. It is the beginning. Uh, there are a lot more work that we can do, but uh, this this cannot be uh, a silo type of work. It has to be a multidisciplinary type of work. So we are inviting not just the engineers, the IT people to come and join us, but also the psychologists, the psychiatrists. You know, the the one from Allied Health Science. You know and so forth, you know. Even right now, we have educationists working together with us to really try and understand inclusive education and learning disabilities. So therefore, these are very important. What I'm trying to say is that uh, it is never ending, but uh, we really need to, to go that one step further. And that one step further is to really try and find solution, okay? And that solution has to be a multidisciplinary type of solution. It's not just working in silos, and you will get where you are. Thank you. Thank you. I, I have a, just a question, and then we'll have Prof. Asad. I have a question from Associate Prof. Dr. Noor Hasinda. Uh, she's saying, Salam Prof, since COVID actually limits contact with each other, what are your suggestions to pursue this EEG research? <laughs> uh, we need wireless. <laughs> This will be a great challenge, you know, to actually do uh, EEG research. But I, I think uh, it's, it's just like how the medical doctors uh, do uh, handle the, uh, what do you call it, the patient, you know. So therefore, in this case here, we need to be careful in handling uh, the participants. Uh, my recommendation at this point of time is that first we have to make sure that both the participants and the researchers who are handling uh, each other uh, needs to go through some kind of a uh, what do you call that swap test, you know. Unless otherwise the swap test is negative, uh, then it, it is going to be tough. You know, the confidence level will be very low. Uh, so, so therefore, in this case here, whatever we want to do the research, of course, uh, it involves money. You know, uh, you have to pay like three hundred uh, over ringgit per test. You know, the swap test. But it is important that we need to make sure that both our participants and the researchers, you know, in this case here, uh, is not, uh, you know, being positive with the COVID. So then, then, then I think well, we feel safer. I don't think, I don't think at the university level, we want to allow any of our researchers to actually do this measurement on, on, uh, on participants 
uh, who are not being uh, measured, you know, as far as the coronavirus is concerned. So I think that is something we need to do. Yeah. Next question is uh, Professor. Here we have. So please, Professor. Yeah. Uh, well, um, since this is um, heterogeneous population when you do this, and generalization is a problem. Mm. Okay, so when we suggest something mm. out of the experiments we do, since it is not generalized, so how can we basically try to focus it to a homogeneous group of mm. the people and then generalize it? Okay, now, uh, like I said, um, most of our work uh, involve uh, relative, you know, rather than absolute. Now, because it is relative, uh, you base on certain uh, standard uh, measurement that the psychological uh, profile has already done. So because of that, uh, uh, homogeneity may not be a critical issue. Because at every measurement, uh, as far as the brain pattern is concerned, uh, we have, for example, the standards. You know? uh, uh, this is a happy, fear, calm, and sad. Uh, and these are the standards that the psychology has already set up. Okay, in the four quadrant. So therefore, in this case here, what we are doing is, I want to know as far as relative measurement of how the brain activate towards all these four. So once I know then, hey, I already have a very good understanding as far as the brain pattern is concerned, when you have this different emotion, okay, this is how the brain will activate. Now what I want to do is, okay, I want to try and see at the uh, idle condition. Initial condition, you know, how uh, is your brainwave patterns behave based on the activation that I know of the standards, the psychological standards, you know. So therefore, in this case here, will uh, A brain and B brain behave the same way? No, it will be different. But because it is relative to the standards, therefore now I know that this is a standard and I can use, for example, DM5. DM5 is the psychological, uh, you know, uh, standards, you know, that they use, you know. So therefore, in this case here, I know, uh, okay, with that, I have some idea in this case here on how to do the correlation. But can my correlation be done uh, and, and uh, establish uh, an absolute or generalized correlation? I cannot. Uh, because, because of the differences, like you said. But, but maybe, maybe if I can have bigger samples, then I can have homogeneous type of, of people, then maybe generalization is possible. But again, a lot of people has tried doing that. Okay, but when it comes to uh, emotion, uh, it becomes almost impossible because even the, the way the brain behaves, each individual in the same uh, in the same group of people, they are very different. I give you an example, you know, uh, in the home, yeah, everything is the same. Uh, but you still have one of your child could be autistic and the other one may not be autistic. So therefore, in this case here, it's almost impossible to create that kind of, you know, homogeneity that you were talking about. So I think. So that is why uh, a lot of people who try to generalize fail, you know. Uh, so that is one of the main so reasons. Sometimes, and this is my second question, sometimes in experimental research, we can control the three conditions. Mm -hmm. And in this case, is it that we can control and we can know the three conditions uh, and then we measure the two different having and have not and then measure and see, see, see the effects of it? Okay. Uh, in general, as far as the brain are concerned, uh, the precondition or in this case here, the initial condition, initial condition. you know, uh, plays an important role to determine uh, the kind of problem that each individual are facing. So therefore, you cannot make use of the precondition anymore because the precondition is used to determine something else. Uh, you use the precondition to to predict. Okay. So in this case here, how can we use the precondition which needs to predict the future or predict whatever the circumstances is? Okay, to be used uh, as the baseline point. So it is going to be tough in this case here. So unless otherwise, unless otherwise, you can set an environment, you can set an environment where in this case here, 
uh, whoever wants to go through the test have the same or similar precondition. Correct? So therefore, in this case here, by hoping, by hoping that this precondition will stimulate the same condition for everybody, which is, again, brain is a challenge. You know? <laughs> you know, so the same, same as dealing with the heart. You know, that is why uh, when, when uh, the doctor, you know, uh, when we, we go and see the doctor and say that, hey, you know, I want to do an ECG research with you, he refused. Because he said, hey, who are you? What kind of expertise? And there is no such thing, you know, as trying to generalize. Now, because even the medical doctor doesn't want to do that, you know. He said, hey, these are the kind of things that even when they predict, you know, and say that oh, your ECG has got problem, you know, they can only do certain uh, confidence level. Correct? Yeah. Right? yeah. So therefore, other than that, uh, it's, it's going to be more of their experience, you know. When this condition exists, this is what it is. Yeah. So therefore, in this particular case, it's going to be yes, a challenge. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, we can have, uh, we still have 10 minutes, so we can have a few more questions. I have a question from Dr. Marini of Man. Uh, future crowdsourcing EEG. Mm. <laughs> Crowdsourcing EEG. Mm. Uh, we are we are trying to work with some uh, some uh, companies right now, uh, and also with uh, our own to develop uh, together with uh, with our counterpart Beyond, you know, in uh, in uh, Germany uh, to try and see if we can develop profiling profiling for uh, for preschoolers. Onwards, you know. In other words, if we can profile uh, our preschoolers uh, based on the, their not just medical but also uh, EEG profile, okay. In other words, then we can we can in this case here try to have a very good understanding uh, as far as the kind of learning disability or learning ability, okay, that our children have, okay, right from preschool. Okay, all the way. So at least, for example, if if now at preschool, you know, now as preschool, we know that these are the set of people that we have or set of students that we have. So we can make sure that the school are ready by the time this uh, student goes to primary one, which is three years down the road. Then we know the kind of teachers that we need to train these people. Okay, especially when we talk about inclusive education. So in this particular case, it becomes critical and important for us to be able to profile our children at that particular age. So I think the future for cloud <laughs> or crowd, you know, cloud sourcing or cloud uh, computing in this case here, yeah, is that uh, there is a lot of opportunity uh, as far as looking at it from that kind of perspective. For crowd sourcing is that, uh, in other words, I can basically uh, enable uh, people to profile okay with a kind of different profile and so forth i'm able to in this case here uh, develop that that kind of situation okay which is very important for us at the country level to understand you know this this uh, this is very important okay yeah. uh, okay we can still have a, a room for one or two questions so before that i just want to i want to call uh, for uh, anyone who wants to have uh, to benefit the humanity to have impact on society i think this is the right place to to come and join we can share with you later the, the link to to this group uh, they have achieved uh, lots of successful stories here we have here dr amira sakti who is one of the the, the results of of this work, who is leading now also one line of group of research. So join, please. You can have impact. Maybe while waiting for another question, Prof, can you just briefly the successful stories of helping the society through through, through this this research? Mm. Right now, most of our main focus, most of our main focus are on uh, on children. Okay. Uh, example I give you, uh, uh, we are working with the uh, Panawa Hospital Group uh, to, to develop uh, uh, apps in trying to profile uh, children. Uh, so our first stage will be that uh, we will actually do profiling 
uh, for preschool. Okay, so if we can profile for preschool, uh, not only using the EEG, but it's at the same time working with the uh, therapist and the psychologist, you know, to actually also have a very good idea of the kind of tests that they have done for these children that we can now correlate very nicely. And our next stage right now is that once we have profile, we have a very good idea, we are going to develop intervention. Okay, uh, we already have some multimedia intervention that our FYP student have developed, like uh, Dr. Muna uh, at the Panama Hospital. So this one here, hopefully that we can use uh, for home intervention, especially in the COVID situation, you know, where we can actually use this, uh, student can be at home and uh, doing their own intervention. Okay. So Panama Hospital is one of the successful one stories. One of the successful stories. Because they saw the, the the results and the potential of, yes. of this group, that's why they approached you. Yes. Okay, we have a question from Associate Prof. Dr. Abdurrahman Ahlan. How much many or how many data sets have been produced from, from this? So as, as far as data sets are concerned, uh, we have... Oh uh, boy. Uh, for the... Uh, oh boy, at least uh, easily about uh, 200. 200 data set uh, of a student uh, from the age of uh, 5 uh, to the age of 10. Okay, to the age of 10, uh, in fact 13, uh, with, uh, with the uh, porn addiction, and to the age of 13. Uh, so covering from uh, learning disability like autistic children, uh, to dyslexic children, to ADHD, to normal children, okay, uh, and also to children with porn addiction, okay, which we do it in uh, in Jakarta. Okay. So I think uh, database, yes, we have. Okay, uh, I have one more question. Maybe, for Prof. <laughs> yeah, Prof, I think uh, your work is on brain learning of our special children. We have e learning group, mm -hmm. and we found during these periods that for the normal children, there are applications available. Mm -hmm. Uh, abnormal, like like mm -hmm. our autistic children, there isn't any application mm -hmm. to teach them online. Sure. Can we integrate some work, your group and our group, to sure. develop a kind of application for those special children? Oh, yes. yes, we will be very, very happy. I think uh, there are a lot of potential, you know. Uh, in fact, uh, Dr. Muna is focusing on the intervention. We call it intervention. Uh, and these are basically intervention to help uh, children uh, from dyslexic to autistic, the only challenge that we have is ADHD. Okay, a student with ADHD is going to be a real big challenge. Okay, but for dyslexic, for example, you can uh, train the brain, you can train the brain, uh, and you can cheat the brain, okay, so that whatever they read uh, is whatever that it is supposed to be. Okay, so this one here requires those kind of multimedia intervention. So I think the answer is multimedia intervention. And yes, we really need people uh, uh, like you who wants to come. I think uh, we can develop an application. Sure. Yeah. Which really can assist the children mm. like, like this is special yeah. needs. Whereas for the normal, we have already. Mm. Normal children now go yeah. uh, they, they have this education through our life, but yeah. special children doesn't have. It's through the world. Yeah. It's not available mm. at all. I think we can, sure. we can develop an application. Sure. Yeah. Okay, we have. Uh, from Dr. Mira, she is saying that exactly like what Prof. Wahab highlighted, last night Prof. Karim uh, Lakani from Harvard Business School shared about crowdsourcing in health domain. It's a promising domain given uh, the fast growing technology. Uh, from Noor Shahira, Salaamu Alaikum Prof. I'm Shahira, PhD student in KOE. My research is related to the ECG signal processing, but my limitation is to find a suitable ECG machine device that match with my research. May I know who can I con contact regarding this matter? Mm -hmm. I am interested to know more on the features of ECG. Actually, uh, if you look at ECG, one of the biggest problems with ECG uh, is trying to actually uh, monitor or extract the uh, signal from the ECG. Uh, I, I have one of my PhD students, rather than look at ECG, we, you, we look at the stethoscope, stratoscope, you know, because the stratoscope is more audible. 
So when you analyze audible signal, uh, they are more manageable. So in other words, uh, you can and you can easily buy uh, what do you call that uh, microphones, you know, uh, that is used to measure the uh, the heartbeat and so forth. And extraction from the audio signal become much much easier, and you can analyze them because they are at high frequencies. You know, they are normally at uh, eight kilohertz sampling rate or even sixteen kilohertz sampling rate. So therefore, in this case here, uh, you can analyze them. And you can get more data from from that. So that I would like to recommend that you look at those rather than the ECG itself, because in analyzing ECG, you find that one of the biggest problem is that they are all at very low frequencies. Okay, and not only that, uh, you need to have a very large spectrum because of the uh, uh, the what do you call it the spikes. Okay, that you receive uh, in all these ECG signals. And uh, those spikes are very critical, uh, unless otherwise you start bringing them to a higher frequency. In other words, you start to do what we call uh, resembling. <laughs> okay, uh, then you find that uh, you know uh, those those are far better off and far easier to handle. You can use the MEL frequency capsule coefficient in this case here to do all your analysis, uh, which is far far easier. Uh, sorry, I have to go and do some. Uh, <laughs> what do you call that? Uh, technical. <laughs> Prof, one last question to, to, to end because we have promised that there will be only one hour. So I want to be sharp. And just, <laughs> I, I, it's a, a nice question. I like it from Nur uh, Azinda. Uh, Prof, if given a chance, what would you want to see for future research for the team? <laughs> uh, as far as the uh, the uh, the team are concerned or the group are concerned, uh, I would like to see uh, more active participation, okay, from the researchers. Uh, there are a lot of potential, a lot of opportunity, and I, I wish that uh, uh, everyone can can move uh, towards the direction, uh, and we can grow the team in this particular area. Uh, even looking at uh, the potential of Panawa itself, the learning disabilities, already there are a lot of research that we can do, uh, which not only talking about research by itself, but research with the benefit. I think, I think this is more important rather than doing research just to publish. But here we are doing research, which we know that the benefit will be for the greater woman. When you talk about sustainability, you know, uh, we can sustain this particular research for as long as we want. I'll give you an example, looking at profiling itself. You know, profiling our, our children, our students, you know, this will help us understand. We can, we can provide that profiling for our uh, educationists, because now the educationists know what to do. Uh, is inclusive education going to work? We are not just going to profile the one with the learning disability, no. We are also going to profile the one with the learning ability, but how much ability are you talking about? So therefore, in this case, the potential are many, but the researchers must want to do it. Okay, unless otherwise they want to do it, they want to come along, you know, and actively participating, you know, and they have to have a lot of initiative on their own. So unless otherwise, I think uh, we'll be just talking about research for the sake of producing paper. You know, uh, that is what our rector doesn't want. <laughs> our rector has always pushed the idea that, no, 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 I, I don't care, you know, so much about how much paper you publish, but will whatever you do benefit the UMA uh, large? I think that's, that's more important because if you can see that, ah, then I think uh, you begin to appreciate, you begin to, to see the fruit, you know, of your success. I think that's what is more important. And I think this webinar is, is one way of people now know, so they can join inshallah and we will share with them the inshallah. links. Please uh, feel free to communicate with us. Thank you very much, Prof. Abdul Hab. I think uh, as a first uh, webinar, uh, which is post-COVID, uh, I think it was very successful for me. I, I'm really happy with we, we all benefited from this. And I promise, inshallah, that every month we will be having uh, uh, such uh, a webinar. Uh, with the me and, and Dr. Muni, we are collaborating on this. Inshallah, we will continue. Thank you very much, all.
we can end with the Sri Kafara and Surah Jalassi. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.